friends and welcome to the introduction video to our glazing unit. I am super excited to teach you how to complete these steps accurately because this portion of your project can make or break something that you might really love that came out of the kiln that you've already created, but whether your glaze turns out well really does determine how you feel about it in the end. So I'm very excited to teach you how to do this correctly and help give you the skills and knowledge to understand what you're doing since before it actually comes out of the kiln, it looks very, very different because when you add glaze onto it, it does not become glassy or shiny the way that you would expect until after you fire it. So it's hard to kind of know what it's going to look like without all of this knowledge. So let's go ahead and break down all of the things you need to know. If you are glazing something that has already been bisque fired, so that means that you can tap on it and it makes a little tinking sound and it's a lot more sturdy and it's no longer in the bone dry stage, then these are your glaze options. The first type I'll tell you about is the Laguna Versa 5 glaze. And this is excellent if you're looking for a solid color. And typically when students paint with these, you don't see very much brushwork, which is something that sometimes students desire. They don't want to have areas where it's darker versus lighter. So if you're looking for solid coverage, this is an excellent option. And it's also great if you're looking for one of those more vibrant colors, because a lot of of our other options are more earthy and more neutral. So these really do cover the actual clay body itself. So the speckles from the speckled buff clay that we use will be completely covered um, if just barely visible with some of the lighter colors. You can recognize this glaze by finding the short squatty jars. So these ones are much shorter than the other glaze options in the pug room. Another option is the potter's choice type of glaze. And these are really nice glazes that you can use to layer over each other. You can mix different colors to get different effects. And they look a little bit more professional compared to the Laguna glazes, just because they have a lot of variety. So when they are covering an area where there's an indent, they typically do have a stronger color in that area compared to where it's flat. So they, they pool in some of those deeper sections of your project, creating more variety. Sometimes students might not expect how thin these glazes can look on some certain surfaces, especially flat areas, because you can sometimes see the brush strokes if you are not careful with adding thick enough layers for this type of glaze. So if you are worried about seeing brush strokes on your project or having some areas be filled in with more glaze and some areas be thinner, then this might not be the option for you. In the front of the classroom by the invisible man and these paper trays, you will find some um, Potter's Choice catalogs where you can see the different color options on actual pottery. It also is really helpful because it shows you uh, what these colors look like and how they differ when you add a light coat of glaze compared to heavy coats of glaze. So some of these you might get the desired color by adding different amounts when you're adding in your layers. So it is really helpful to look through this and find the color that you're looking for because for example for textured turquoise sometimes students are really disappointed to have their projects come out very brown when really to get that color you have to add pretty heavy coats of glaze to make the teal show through. There are also some um, mixing sheets where you can see what happens when you mix colors together and sometimes you do get very unexpected results because of the chemical buildup of these glazes. So you can see that when you mix different colors you do get different effects. However I will say that with this option it typically doesn't show the effects unless there's like a deeper groove or a lot of texture. So if you're attempting to do this on just a flat surface, it is not as successful as if you were doing it in an area where there's like grooves and round parts compared to flat parts so you can see what the effects actually are. Next we have our crystallites glaze, which I consider sort of a special effect glaze. These are really fun because they give you these 
textures and patterns that appear because of small little beads of glaze that when they reach high temperatures in the kiln sort of burst on your project and create all of these special little marks. Now a lot of these glazes are not food safe so if you do use them you need to read the label and see whether or not they are able to be put on something that is meant for consumption or for food use. So um, make sure you're reading and double checking and also know that sometimes these can drip so those little special effect beads can slide if they are on a vertical wall. So sometimes students will be really disappointed if they use these on their mugs and all of the beads kind of like slide down to the bottom. Now it's a glaze by glaze possibility that that might happen. Some of them are drippier than others but it is something you should consider before choosing these glazes. These are also the glazes that I restock last, and so it does depend on our budget for that year what I have in stock as far as the crystallite glazes, but they are really fun and create some super cool textures. The fourth and final type of glaze I'll tell you about is our dipping glaze selection, and that's what can be found in all of those really large buckets in the bottom of the pug room. So with this type of glaze, you want most of your project to be that one color. You do have the option of adding a little bit of wax or latex over the top of a section of your piece so that it doesn't actually take on that glaze color, but you will have to remove it later on, or if you're using wax, it will burn off in the kiln. So you do have the option of leaving some sections and not having it be the color that you dipped in, but the majority should end up <laughs> the same color. So if that's not what you're looking for, then this is not the glaze for you. So if you are working with the dipping glaze, it is really important that you follow the instructions that are wit written on the whiteboard in the pug room. And it explains how to mix together the glaze because you'll be using a power drill that has a blending um, attachment on the end of it and you'll be blending that glaze for at least 30 seconds and making sure that you're kind of scraping around on the bottom to get all of that sediment mixed together so that you have a nice consistency then you'll be using one of the clamping tools to dip your project into the glaze hold for a couple of seconds and then lift back up and let it drip out so that you don't have any collections of really thick glaze, especially inside of a container. So this is a great option for dishware. Um, it's got some really interesting color choices, so it is a fun glaze to work with as well. All of those glaze options were meant to go on to something that has been bisque fired like we talked about at the beginning of this video. So making sure that you are using the correct glaze is very important because in the pug room there is a different type of glaze that's meant for adding on to pottery that's still greenware which means that it has not been fired yet. So that is something that you would do if you were doing something specific for that project like if you are working on on a sgraffito project where you apply the glaze first and then carve into it or if you have specific permission from me to work with the under glazes that we have as far as the color versions then that is something that's different but please make sure that you are not grabbing a type of glaze that's called under glaze. <laughs> All of the items I'm going to explain are things that you need to grab before you begin glazing what the glaze looks like in the pug room so you can see that it's separated out by color and there's also a separate shelf just up here which is where we keep the under glaze so please make sure that you are not using any of these glazes because those are meant for using before your project has been fired for the first time so unless you're doing this graffito project or you have specific permission do not grab from the glazes up here Next, down below, we have all of our Laguna and Potter's Choice and Crystallite glazes as options for you just beneath here. And you can see that they are organized by color, so you can look for the color that you're looking for. And they're all just sort of mixed together, so you need to remember that the Laguna glazes, or the Versa 5, come in these short squatty jars, and these ones are very, very solid, compared to the Potter's Choice glazes, 
that come in these taller jars, they typically have the picture on the side of what they're sometimes going to turn out to look like. And uh, the crystal-like glazes are um, in bottles like this, and they say crystallites up at the top, and these are sort of the special effect ones. So those are the different types of glazes that we have on these shelves. And then if you're looking for the dipping glazes, we have them in these buckets just beneath. So uh, we do also have some of the powdered glazes to mix in. So if we are ever low for any of these colors, just let me know. And the color is typically written on the side of the bucket, sometimes also on the lid. As you're choosing which colors to use, it can be really helpful to see what they look like when they're actually painted onto the clay itself. So you can come up to this glaze chart and check out what they look like. On the back, it should have the name written, so you can check that out. And um, I did have two different types of clay that I, I painted these onto for most of the examples. I did a different type of clay at my previous school, so some of the examples are on a different lighter color of clay, which makes them just a little bit different in tone. So you can see this is our speckled buff clay, and that's the color difference. So it does come out just slightly more neutral. Um, so make sure that you're paying attention to whether or not it's on this whiter clay or the speckled buff clay that we are using in this classroom. On this tile, you can see that the clay itself is sort of speckly. So that's what's going to show through on a lot of the Potter's Choice um, types of glaze. Whereas if you look at, for example, um, this dark coral, you don't really see those speckles showing through quite as much because this is a Laguna Versa 5 and you don't see the speckles as much as you do with the Potter's Choice. You should also notice that some of these colors are very light and they only collect in like the deeper sections of texture. So this is an example where you can see that the darker portion of that color is only in the section that has texture and the area that was flat didn't really keep that color on it very well. So it's important to kind of look and see what these examples look like on the actual tiles themselves. If you're looking for a dipping glaze, the examples for those are just up on the top and you can see that those pieces have actually been dipped. So you can see what it looks like if you are interested in dipping one of your projects. Before you ever begin working with the glaze itself, you need to have a very thoroughly thought out glaze plan drawn up. So that means that you're drawing your project. It can just be a simple sketch and you need to label every section to be what color you're choosing. I like to draw out my sketches and have one color like just written next to it with lines to all of the areas of my project that I'm going to paint that one color. That way, when I have that color out and I've already taken the time to open it and mix it and it's ready to go, then I can paint all of those sections that are going to be that color at the same time and not forget about a section or not realize that I wanted to paint it that color and have to do that process all over again. So it's really important to have that glaze plan already drawn up and thought out. Once you've got that ready, you're going to collect this list of supplies. First, you need a painting brush. That's going to be from the paintbrush section. Same with a stirring brush, which you're just using the handle to stir your paint container all the way. Next, you're going to need a paper towel so that you can use that to clean off your stirring brush and to rest your painting brush when you are not actively painting. And you will also need two sheets of paper, both your painting plan, that's all thoroughly thought out with your colors listed, and a piece of scrap printer paper so that you can put it underneath your project while you're painting and avoid making a mess on the table that you have to clean up later. 
When you're ready to collect your paintbrush for this unit, you're going to go underneath the paint section that's over by the wheels, and you're going to locate this portion of the cabinet, and this is where you'll find a couple of different options of paintbrushes. Now, all of the paintbrushes that I use for my class are in this section, and it's really important that you know which brushes to use. The brushes that are in these containers are meant for watercolor and acrylic. So please do not use these brushes. We want to work with just the brushes that are in these tin cans. So as you can see, these brushes are a little bit older. Um, you can see that some of them have a little bit of separation, but that is okay for glaze because glaze is a very, very thick substance typically, almost like watery yogurt is the thickness that you're looking for. So uh, just making sure that you're using these is really important because when you do work with glaze in a paintbrush, it changes it forever. It makes it much, much thicker. It is very hard to rinse it all the way out. As you can see, there's like a little bit of dust that kind of comes out when you swipe across these. And so if you use our newer paintbrushes for the glaze, it kind of ruins them just forever. So there's really not much that you can do to fix it afterwards. So using these older brushes is very important. We do have some smaller ones that you can still use for like the intricate details that you're working on, but just make sure that you're grabbing from the tin cans or any open container rather than these can boxes, the sets, or from the brand new brushes. So they should always be used brushes. This is also where you'll grab a used mixing brush. The glaze painting plans can be found just in the paper section underneath the elf and will be in one of these slots. And the piece of printer paper that you can paint on top of is in this tray just at the very top right corner underneath the projector screen. And as you're working with this, I want you to continue using it all the way until it's just no longer usable. Sometimes students use these and paint on them for just five minutes and have a little tiny blob of glaze and then get a whole new sheet of paper the next day. But I'd like for you to try to keep your piece of scrap paper all the way through until the end of the unit so that we are not wasting paper. So to recap, the supplies you'll need will be a painting brush for your glaze, a stirring brush, paper towel, your complete glaze plan, and your piece of printer paper to paint on top of. This section will explain how to open a glaze jar that is stuck. Some of these glaze containers are very difficult to open, and so I'm going to show you an in-depth tutorial of how to open these because we are all strong, independent people that can open our own jars. So um, there are some tricks to this, and I'm going to just show you those. And the first is just recognizing, okay, like this one's really tricky to open. I can try to use all of the strength from my fingers, but that's not really helping me out very much right now. So first I'm going to look and as you can see, there's like a little section of glaze right here that's just underneath the lid. And that means that there was some on the rim when this lid got closed and it's sort of securing it like glue. So you have two options to help loosen up that glaze because that is the reason why this is not easy to open. So first you can go over to a counter. Do not do this at a table because it'll shake your whole table for all of your table mates, but you can go over to a counter and you can just tap this onto the surface or that corner to try to loosen it up. So I'm just going to just very gently tap that along the edges and I'm really looking for these sections where there's a lot of glaze pooled underneath the lid. And I'm just very gently tapping that to help loosen it up. You can see that some of the crumbs will start to fall out. And my second option, if that is not working out for me, is I can take this under the sink and just rinse that very gently and kind of loosen up that glaze that's underneath the lid with my fingernail. Once you've done that, you do need to dry this off so that it doesn't make it slippery as you're trying to turn the lid. Next, I like to tilt this on the side, like the corner, like this, and hold my hands at different angles so that my thumbs are like faced opposite of each other. And then I'll just twist the opposite direction 
and it starts to loosen up. This section will explain some glazing steps and some incredibly important rules of glazing to help you be successful. Now, looking at this glaze, you can see it's pretty watery. So what I need to do is really take some time to stir, which is our next task. So stirring your glaze is one of the most important things that you can do to make sure that it has an even consistency once it's fired. So we're going to take our stirring brush and we're going to use the handle of it to mix all of this glaze up, making sure that we're scraping all along the bottom. And you should set a timer on your phone to do that for at least one minute. Now, if you've done one minute and you still see some little swirls of color, I would recommend keep on going for a little bit, but there are some colors where the swirls just won't go away very easily. So if you do it more than two minutes, that's probably all you need to do. If they're not mixing together, they probably won't. So stirring is a super important part and that's your next step. The consistency you're looking for is that if you dip your finger into this glaze and you can see the outline of your fingernail, but not all of the little intricate details, that means that it's the correct thickness. So you sort of want it to be like watery yogurt almost. So if you open your jar and it is very dried out, we can revive it if you still want to use that color, but we need to, um, you need help in doing that. So please don't try to do this on your own, but I will slowly add water back into this glaze to mix it together and help it revive itself. So if it's a little bit too dry, know that I can revive it, but it'll take some time. As you're glazing your project, there are some really important things to be thinking about. And the first is that you need to know where that color is going all around your sculpture so that you don't have to complete these steps multiple times for the same color. So make sure you've got your painting plan out and next to you so that you know all of the areas where that color is going to go. You also need to be thinking about how many layers you are adding. If you're working with Potter's Choice, it is really helpful to look at that layer guide so that you can see what effect it has if you do a lighter layer versus a heavier layer. So having that out and having that knowledge of what you need to do to make the color that you want to have happen actually happen is really important. For a general rule of thumb, adding two decent, like medium thick, layers of glaze is really what you need for most colors. So for the Laguna Versa 5 glazes, you'll definitely just add the two solid layers. Now, when you're adding a layer, you need to go all the way around that section or project, complete it all the way, let it dry most of the way, and then come in and add your second layer. And that's a mistake that a lot of students make is that they will come in when they're glaze is still wet and they'll try to add in their second layer and it's really just making globs. It's not like going through and truly adding a second coat. So make sure that you've done your first layer all the way through, let it dry most of the way, and then complete your second layer for that section. Depending on whether you're using Potter's Choice glaze, you might consider adding more layers or thicker layers because that glaze is particularly thin and there are quite a few colors that don't show up as well, especially on flat surfaces. So you might consider adding more for those. The third and final thing that you should really be considering as you're painting and glazing your projects is that you cannot have any glaze on any area of your project that touches the table when you set it down. So if you do have glaze on the bottom of your project and I can see that it touches the table or the shelf when you turn it in, I will not fire it for you. So you need to make sure that you have cleaned off the glaze if you do accidentally get it somewhere where it's not supposed to be. And that's one of the best parts is that if you do make a mistake and you paint down underneath something and that's an area that's touching the table, you can just take a damp paper towel or sponge and just remove it off of the bottom. So I'm really looking that it doesn't have like the actual 
globs or strokes of glaze. Sometimes when you remove glaze from the bottom of something, it does leave a little bit of a stain, but that is not something I'm concerned about. The reason why we can't have glaze on the bottom of your project is because when it goes into the kiln, that glaze is going to fuse itself to the shelf that it's resting on, and it will become one solid piece with the shelf. So for me to be able to separate those pieces, I have to take an ice pick and break your project off of the shelf, which is heartbreaking for me So and for you. So please make sure that you follow this step correctly. It's one of the most important steps that you can listen to during this episode, is that you cannot have glaze anywhere where it's touching the table. If you have glaze that you are worried about running, so say you are working with Potter's Choice and you're using really thick layers and you are trying to reach a certain color so you are doing those thicker layers, I would recommend leaving a little gap before the bottom of your project. Now that's not something that I say lightly because I don't want you to leave a big chunk of your clay unpainted and have just like a solid like dusty looking section of clay compared to your glassy shiny glaze but it is important that we make sure that we leave a little bit of a gap if you are worried about it. While you're painting, you should also make sure that you aren't leaving gaps in between sections that are different colors. So if you have yellow next to red and you leave a big gap in between, when you're working with the glaze, it doesn't really look that obvious because the color of the clay body is fairly light. It's like a peachy tone. The glaze is like a soft, dusty color. So it doesn't really look like a big deal when you leave a little bit of a gap in between those two colors. But once it's fired, those colors are going to be very vibrant, they're going to be very glassy and shiny, and the clay that's in between is going to get a little bit darker and it's going to get spots on it. So if you leave a gap, it's going to be very apparent when it comes out of the kiln. So making sure that every section of your clay is covered except for the bottom is what I'm looking for from you. So to recap the steps of brush glazing, first you're going to plan out every part of your sculpture so you know if you want to use one color in multiple areas of your project so you can complete these steps all at once and not have to repeat. You also need to have all of your supplies, including the paintbrush that you are using from the tin cans, a stirring paintbrush, a paper towel, your glaze plan, and a piece of paper that you'll use throughout the entire glazing unit to paint your project on top of. Next, you're going to go to the pug room and select one color at a time that you would like to use, and you'll bring that to your table, and you can only work with one at a time. You're going to stir between one to two minutes, so make sure you set a timer on your phone or at least keep an eye on the clock to make sure it's been long enough. And as you're painting, you'll do at least two coats every time. If you're working with the Potter's Choice glazes, I would definitely recommend either doing heavier coats or adding in additional coats. Your most important requirement is that you cannot have any glaze where your project touches the table. If you do, you can wipe it off with a wet paper towel or sponge. As long as there's not thick glaze on the bottom, I can fire it. If you wipe it away, it will have like a little bit of a stained color and that's fine. But if you have little drops or smudges of glaze, even just a little that's actually chunky on the bottom of your project, I will not fire it because it will ruin the kiln shelves and your project. Glaze must cover every other part of your project, so no gaps between the colors. Once you're finished glazing with that color, you're going to put the lid on tight to make sure that it doesn't come off for other students when they grab it behind you. Then you're going to return it to the glaze room and put it in the correct color section. It's super important that you wash out your brushes between the colors so that you're not contaminating the next color and ruining your color on your actual project. Then you're going to select your next color and begin this process all over again. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this episode. I hope it was helpful to see all of the steps and rules of glazing broken down so that you can understand how to make your project as successful as possible. So let's go ahead and start glazing. Thanks for watching.